or just let me go there. Okay. Sorry, this takes me just a little bit longer than the Facebook stuff. Well, because finding the video is just a little bit harder. There it is. Okay. You know, you know like last time, I'm going to give just a little bit of time for people to show up because this is kind of new, you know, this isn't the normal thing, and I don't have... I mean, well, I don't care, we'll just go for it, right? People will come in, and uh, they'll catch up. So these are my plaster molds. I made the original out of clay, and then I put them on some piece of glass, and then cast plaster around them, took the clay out, and then I got these little forms. And they're considered a press mold. So I can take the clay and I'll press it <laughs> into the mold. I don't have to use slip or anything, just pressing the clay in. And I do the other side. And you can make press molds in different ways. Some people, and I have some of my own, I will press the clay into one side and the other side, and they're two different mold, two different halves, and I squish them together. And that squished together part ends up, you know, kind of putting them together. But these, I want a little bit different look. I want them to be like they're two sections that are stuck together. Then to, to to go to the next part, you cut it with a piece of fish line so that you don't hurt the mold. And then I take my plastic rubber ribby thing. And I'm going to scrape down till I get to the clay to get the extra clay off. It's not part of the mold. Like in the middle there. Because this is a surface that will end up attached to each other, it doesn't have to be super cleaned up or smooth or anything, just so that it's not a lot of extra clay sticking out of it. I take the clay that I've used to kind of get scraped off there, the extra stuff, pat it flat, and I get it wiggly and stuck to a corner there. I do that in a few spots, and then the half pops out. And you see on this one that there's like that little groove there, that weakness. For my work, I want it to look, you know, like crappy castings and old stuff. So I leave them. If I didn't want those kind of things, when I push it in the mold, I wouldn't let there be any joints and anything that came together. And I'll, I'll do that on the next one. So you can see what it's like to do it like in a sort of right way. Hello, Holly. Again, I know this isn't as, as exciting. I'm sorry. Some parts of pottery are kind of boring to to watch, but I said I was going to do all the parts of these lunch mugs, so I'm going to do all of it. I didn't include, luckily for you, making another um, handle and doing the casting and all that. So in the end, these two things would get stuck together. I'm going to let them set up until maybe next week. And I would then put a contrasting color of goo in between them and then squish them together. I might also then underglaze them and add rivets and stuff, but that's that's a little bit down the road. Hey, <laughs> Green River Wood Company. <laughs> I think I figured there's no way that somebody asked that question, and it wasn't you. But I thought, well, you know, it's serendipitical, I guess. And then we'll do we'll just do we'll do one of each of the. The newer ones here. This one I'll do without trying to leave one of those those casting, you know, kind of crud marks. If I start with a coil that's going to fill that whole part in that doesn't have wrinkles on it. Like that. 
important that you really press these into the mold so you get all the detail, especially if the mold contains a lot of detail. <laughs> this is like super advanced Play-Doh Fun Factory stuff right here. Man, if I had something like this when I was a kid and I knew how to do it, I could have made all sorts of things I could have sold. Make my own, make my own He-Man toys and stuff. Just have to borrow, borrow Justin Hewitt's He-Man toy. Go home, make a mold of it, cast my own. Same thing, we got that. Put that guy on my board over here. We start at a corner, get it stuck. You know, you gotta, gotta wiggle a little bit to get it stuck onto it. And pull it out. I don't use cornstarch or any kind of release agent because I don't want it in my clay. I don't want it taking up any detail or whatever. I just use use my clay, right? And see how that's a smooth one? I got a little nublet there. But see how these two were smooth without those joints? Same kind of thing. This one is my favorite one. It's also the pain in the buddiest one to get out of the mold. I'm using a little bit stiffer clay only because of this mold here. Normally when you do it nice and soft, it's easier to push. Like I'm having to really jam, jam this clay in. But if I do this one with, a, with wet clay, I can't get them out of the mold. They just rip apart. And it's probably why I like it the best. <laughs> it's not that it's a better one, it's just, it's harder, so I like it more. Um, Green River Wood Company, I forgot your name name. And I could just call you green, but that seems weird. Because I had, I forgot the question, but I could answer them now as I'm doing this. Or tell you where I would find the answers to the things. Curtis, yes, Curtis. I knew it was going to be a problem. Nice to meet you too, Curtis. So I'm guessing that your normal business is wood. That, and that it's on the Green River somewhere. And that you harvest the wood and you process it and you sell it as lumber. And that in doing so, you have a lot of byproduct wood stuff lying around and that firing a kiln with it yeah, let's see look how hard this one is damn it come on prefab stick So you get, well, you just make the common common stair runs and sell made stairs. Same thing. <laughs> I like the idea of that you're that you're lumberjack though. I 
Ah, finally. See how cool that one is, though? <clears throat> because this is a plaster mold, I could let it sit in the mold a little bit, but I've tried that and I've messed them up from just letting them sit. The, they kind of pinch around the center part. Just a little bit, it just takes more working, which is really good TV. Ooh, there we go. Nothing like watching a guy poke at a plaster mold, right? Okay. <laughs> mental, mental, uh, mental uh, telepathy uh, mold releasing. <laughs> That one, that one. Sticking together there, and now we got other things because those are the three. Those are the three half pressy mold things. We have these here that I call handle receivers, and I use them for the leather type handles. So I extrude this kind of handle. I made the cross section extruder die, which you kind of push and it squirts out this almost like a belt type surface. And then I stamp it with a little roller stamp that makes the stitches. And then it goes into these little this handle receiver. Because you don't know it's want to stick like a leather onto the side of a can or something. It doesn't make any sense. So it's got to go into something. And uh, this is one of the somethings. And I got a whole bunch of different somethings that they can go into. So that it gets its own look each time uh, it's used on its own mug. They have different... They have different personalities and depending on the illustration on the mug or the mug itself I'll use different ones but we'll make one of each here because I got a bunch of made a bunch of different mugs during the, the lunchtime mug makey thing these should come out a lot better you notice they're kind of curved too that helps them match the uh, pot that they go on so if they were straight, when I go to put it on a, a mug, and have to bend it around there. And that means the tension in that piece will want to pull it back off as it dries. So having them pre-bent keeps them from kind of popping off. I don't mind if they, if they pop off, but only when I want them to. So I might peel up an edge, you know, rather than putting like a rivet there, I'll put a hole all the way through and then have it peel up a little bit like the rivet popped off and now it's not attached well anymore. In terms of like building up that story of a piece. But I want to do that on purpose. I don't want to tamp it on accident. All the clay that I end up wasting from this. Because it could get a little chunk of plaster in it. I end up not keeping. Some people will keep it. I don't keep it. I don't like this one. So we're not going to use that one. We can do this one though. So really, I've got to make a bunch of these, Curtis. If you want to ask your questions here, that way I don't have to type out my answers, that would be fine. I mean, I don't know if anybody here is going to protest me answering wood fire questions. Anybody, uh, anybody have a protest against that? Say aye. Okay, then. <laughs> no protest. We'll continue. That's if you got the time. I mean, if you don't have the time. This one is a little bit harder to get out because the, uh, the mold is so curved that you got to get this edge out from behind that first.
can. You can wiggle it. Boop. Like that. So that one's more like a little clampy belt type style one. I don't know if you guys... Young, young men with poor belt habits, you know, you end up with like three or four belts that you can reverse so you can get a brown or black one. That's, I based, <laughs> I based the, uh, that little receiver on those belts. For these, the lunchtime mugs, I was going to show everything. I'm just thinking about it. It's like I've got all those extruded handles, so I'm not going to do the extrusion on video, but I will. Uh, I will explain it when we go to put them together. The um. The, like if it's a red brick, we've used them. I mean, it's a fired, it's a fired brick, so it can withstand some temperature, but the amount of iron that's in a red brick ends up acting as a flux. And our chimney that we had, um, in our first iteration of our wood kiln, we, uh, we used the, uh, the red, red brick, uh, <laughs> We, I don't, I don't want to say we stole it, but we, we, we got the brick in a, in a hinky sort of fashion. Um, at the college I was at at the time, they had taken out a brick walkway. And uh, I asked one of the, the maintenance guys there that I knew pretty well. And I said, hey, what are they going to do with all that brick? And they said, oh, they're just going to put it in a pile up there and eventually just throw it away. I said, do you think it'd be a problem if I like, took it? He said, no, it'd be less for us to throw away. So we rented a steak rack truck. We put as much brick on it as we could fit. I didn't really, you know, I was young. I didn't really understand that there's like a weight limit for, for those kind of trucks. And uh, I guess if you don't know, then it's not going to hurt anything. <laughs> uh, we were over that weight limit by a few, by a few tons probably. Anyway, we had the whole brick rack truck filled up with these pallets of brick. And uh, there, uh, one of the security guards came down. And he goes, whoa, whoa, what are you guys doing? Because this, this pile is kind of like in the back of the school. You know, like a trash pile almost. And he says, you know, what are you guys doing? I said, well, you know, talk to so-and-so. And he said, uh, you take the brick. And he goes, well, you stay right here. I was like, yeah, yeah, go, go talk to him. And we... <laughs> <laughs> we abandoned any of the other brick that we were going to get. We piled all in the truck and we laughed as fast as we could. And uh, we never spoke of it again. <laughs> so we used that brick for the chimney once. And then after about eight firings, we had to rebuild that. And that lasted another, you know, five, six firings. And then we went to real hard brick. Um, because replacing it was a becoming more of a pain it just melts down breaks up you could get away with low fire but you couldn't couldn't get hot enough to melt ash and i think if you fire with wood and you don't melt ash you're going to let get left with issues on pots like if you do a low fire, you'd almost have to do a. <laughs> you'd almost have to do, a, you know, like a sagger where you'd put the pieces inside of these little things, or build up, you know, like a a wall almost to prevent the ash from getting, to the work. I'm gonna let that sit. We're gonna, because I'm right here doing these. I I won't leave it too long. Well, the chim we had other chimney ideas, and um, there was a metal, there was a metal guy, not a metal guy, I mean, it was this huge metal recycling 
processing plant thing and uh that was on the way to school and you know i'd stop by and i'd look and i'd be like oh man that pipe would be a perfect chimney and <laughs> so one day and i had a, a pontiac sunbird i took the back seat out and uh you know, and that was a that was a pain in the butt to get the back seat out, and I had it all ready to to, to uh, take a metal pipe that was a perfect chimney. Now this metal pipe it wasn't like in a fence. It wasn't it wasn't stored any place that uh, you know made it seem like it was a desirable piece of metal. But knowing that it was metal, I knew what that piece of pipe meant. That if I took it, I was stealing. But I thought, man, that piece of pipe is just going to go to waste there. It's just going to rot away. And I could use it as a chimney. So my friend and I, I mean, this pipe must have weighed three, 400 pounds. And uh, we're trying to horse it into the back of my Pontiac Sunbird. Um, <laughs> we, we got it like just on the tailgate. And a guy pulls up in a pickup truck yelling and screaming. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I don't know. I just thought this was tra <laughs> trash. And that pipe is still there, rotting away 20 years later. And actually, the business is gone. It was the metal recycling business no longer exists. I could go back and finally get my pipe. <laughs> um, so if you can melt the if you can melt the glaze, you know, like what what like if you wanted to do cone six and uh you're able to get the cone to the kiln to cone six and melt the glaze. It should be. The only thing that would be an issue is if you built up a lot of ash and it didn't melt, the glaze could be rough. And it's not that the glaze is gonna kill anybody from roughness, it's just gonna be yucky to use. <laughs> it's exciting? I don't know if it's exciting. This is like the most boring live stream. This is right after watching my cat sleep. That's the most boring. Then watching Tim pull press molds. Horribly pull press molds. So it's all stretched out and warped. That's fine. It's supposed to be. Yay, Shelby! You don't you don't talk to your your teacher and go well Tim C says this <laughs> this is funny what I teach I've got people you know that'll that'll go to YouTube and they'll they'll watch something and they'll come to class and be like well Simon Leach does it this way <laughs> or <laughs> Earth Nation Earth Nation does it this way screw Dante don't listen to him. No, I stunk at it for a lot longer than you ever will, Lee. I stunk for about four years. <laughs> Didn't stop, but I stunk. I'm going to have to... Cut a little of that mold out, maybe. You know, if it's got any undercuts, it's gonna bite onto it. And you know, normally you'd see like a scrape somewhere. And I don't see any scrapes, which is why I haven't cut the mold at all. But man, for it to hang up that much, it sure seems like it's got an undercut. <laughs> that is true. 
being bad at pottery is <laughs> more fun than being good at other things. That's a shirt right there. <laughs> Shelby, no! Well, the Olsen Fast Fire Kilns are an awful lot of brick per stacking space. Um, and if you're looking at, like, getting used to a kiln and everything, that and that might be one to, to do all the research on. Um, I mean, the kiln works. Um, there are a lot of them out there. But when you look at brick efficiency and how many... How many bricks it takes to give the volume of space that you can stack. It's not the most efficient kiln. Do you have kiln shelves already? Because that's like, that ends up being a huge expense. I think our kiln has about 85 kiln shelves that we can use. And, you know, and if each kiln shelf is about a hundred bucks, like eight and a half grand of stupid kiln shelves. Yeah, I would say before completely, you know, getting married to a design, look for used kiln shelves, you know, and if you find a kiln shelf that ends up being, you know, 12 by 24, that you would kind of base your kiln design around that kiln shelf. Um, that's what we ended up doing. We got our 85, our, well, we probably over the years have gotten probably 200 or more of those kiln shelves for free. And uh, because of a, rela a relationship we had with a manufacturer, you know, they imported a kiln from England that was way too big for them to ever use. And it came with the kiln shelves. And, uh, they were able to sell the kiln, but they couldn't sell the kiln shelves. So they were just like, anybody want these? And we were like, yes! And uh, we took as many as we could at the time. And uh, after a few years, they, uh, you know, reached out to us again and said, hey, you know, we were, we got more of those kiln shelves that uh, they were just buried under pallets of stuff. You know, they, if you want them, come back out and get them. And we did. We got super lucky there. We actually sold the kiln shelves for like, I think it was 20 bucks a piece to help pay for parts of the kiln, like the brick and the castable. I think this is going to be the last one. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we got two extras in case something goes horribly wrong. But before, before I end up using them, and I guess for the people that are here, you can, you can respond or not, um, is, like, I've got to color these. So I've got to paint them in underglaze and put the details on them. Is that something that people care about? You know, <laughs> you know, if you don't care about it, I can just sit here and watch Netflix and do it. But if you care about it, I will totally, I will totally live stream the heck out of it for you guys. Because I think participating like this is more beneficial than me watching the Netflix. <laughs> okay, is yeah, is this as long as you like you write every once in a while, like just like, hey, I'm still here, don't leave, even though nobody's commenting and it's sad. <laughs> because basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these things I'm going to put underglaze on them and maybe I'll do some of them ahead of time so you're not having to see the whole thing and then I will put the details on like the rivets and the screws I'll drill some holes, I'll thread them I'll do stuff like that but we'll do that as a uh, I'll do it as a live stream but it might be before next Thursday I have a feeling I'll just do these lunchtime, 2 o'clock you know, it's after my lunch and it gives me time to come in, set up and everything. 
Yeah, just anything. Just be like, hey, did you know dogs really like... And then make something up. <laughs> well, that's me working. Meow, meow, boop. You know, I can do some boops. I can, I can make a whole... I can make a playlist. Just like a sounds of Tim working in the studio. Just boops and meows and slapping stuff. All right. But that's it, guys. Um, we will... These will be a couple days for them to set up enough for me to, to work on them next. And I will be back in a couple days then. Okay, bye bye! Uh oh.